All right, guys, welcome back to our <clears throat> officially our first subject that we're going to be looking at, our first content, which is Nasir. Um, the first section is what are the conditions that led to the rise of Nasir? So before we can actually look at him as a leader and his policies and what he did, we have to look at Egypt and what exactly was happening in Egypt that led to Nasir. So Egypt before 1952. This is background information. Um, from 1882, the British had occupied Egypt. They basically had full control. Um, one of the reasons why Egypt was a point of interest to so many nations, but the British especially, was because of the Suez Canal. Um, this canal basically was a canal that was created, an artificial canal um, that created a gateway, basically, for, for shipping boats, for trading, uh, for them to be able to like go from like Europe to different parts of Asia using the Mediterranean instead of having to go all the way around Africa. And I'll show you in a map in a second. Um, but the canal was used by the British, especially during World War One. They placed tight restrictions against uh, Egypt because of World War One, and Egypt had no say in what was happening in their country, let alone the canal, which was on their territory and belonged to them. During the war, Egypt was used as a base. Aside from that, you know, it's not just that they used the canal, but they used Egypt as a base. Thousands of troops landed on Egyptian soil. Um, this led to Egyptian farmers having to force their land and basically to give their um, livestock, you know, their animals and their crops to the soldiers to feed them, basically. Um, as you can probably imagine, this was not a very popular thing for Egypt. Um, the Egyptians. The Egyptians were not very happy. This is what I meant about the canal. So the canal, as you can see in this picture on the right side, is where that star is. Um, it's on Egyptian soil, basically. And so they opened up this waterway so that they can go from the Mediterranean Sea all the way to like parts of the Middle East, Asia, India, especially India, because India was a territory of of the British during this time, so they needed an easier access. On the left side, you see the, the, the line in red is the pathway that they used to have to take before the canal. So they'd have to circle all the way down to the southern tip of Africa. Um, but with the canal being opened, you can see in the blue, all they have to do is take that shortcut right there where Egypt is through the canal, and basically it takes way less time. So that's why there was a lot of interest in keeping Egypt a, col um, a colony, basically, um, for the British. Um, World War II made it clear to Egyptians that they wanted their independence. They, they were tired of being the puppets of the British. Um, uh, Zaglul, I think I'm saying that right, I think, who was a member of the Egyptian government, he was part of the Waft Party, uh, political party. Basically, he demanded that Egypt be represented during the Paris peace talks because they had played a role in World War I and they wanted to be part of that conversation of what is going to happen. They wanted to reap the benefits, right? This should really trigger some thoughts as to uh, Japan during the Paris peace talks and then Italy not getting anything as well. Uh, obviously the British refused. They told them to basically go away, um, but before they punished, uh, before they, you know, rejecting, they basically punished uh, Zaglul uh, for questioning their authority. Um, they basically said, how dare you, I, you know, ask for representation after helping us and giving us your crops and your soil and all of that stuff. Uh, Egyptians were already hating the, the British, but this upset them even more. So in 1919, you see riots take place. About 29 British soldiers and 800 Egyptians were killed during these riots. There were big ones, mass scales. Tension continued to rise. It wasn't until 1922 that the British government agreed to give Egyptians their independence. Quotations, because independence was not necessarily what was given. It was only by name. Um, and the reason why is because the British still had some control over what was happening in Egypt, and they still had control over the Suez Canal. Okay? So it's really important to look at that. Next slide. Pause if you need to. Egypt, uh, continue with Egypt um, before Nazir. Um, the transition into independence, uh, an independent country was going well at first. There was some changes in the constitution, but the king was still allowed, uh, Egypt had a king during this time, was still allowed to retain their power. 
1924 uh, was the first legislative election, you know, their own version of Congress, right? Uh, the WAF party was very popular, especially because uh, of the leader Zaghul, the guy that was like banished by the British for demanding rights. Uh, his party won 90% and he was placed at the like basically the leadership of that. So he becomes the prime minister of Egypt. Um, unfortunately, he was not a very tolerant person, right? So you see this transfer of power, this transfer of authority, at least f fake transfer of authority going from the British to the Egyptian government, but nothing's really necessarily changing. The people aren't the common people aren't really getting anything out of this. Um, he was very restrictive with his laws, newspapers, and silenced anybody who opposed him. Uh, it, he died in 1927, which was a big deal for Egypt because he was basically the only guy that knew how to... He was experienced. He was the only guy that had any type of experience in politics and in government. And so it's like, who who's going to come up after him? Who knows? Because nobody knows how to do anything, right? Um, in 1936, the terms of the Declaration of Independence that gave Egypt their independence was revised with the Anglo-Egyptian Treaty of 1936. This new treaty between the British and, the, and Egypt loosened Britain's control on Egypt a bit, uh, but the British were still allowed to uh, station their troops in Egypt's soil. Um, you can read that article if you want to read it, pause, but basically it's just basically the king of Egypt saying, yeah, the king of... Uh, um, the British, the British Empire is allowed to have their troops on our soil because they need to reach the Indian territory, right? Because in uh, the British owned India, basically. Uh, 10,000 troops and 400 pilots uh, is how many numbers they had with basically just all this personnel stationed in the area of the canal and they had control of the canal. Uh, with the British still occupying, this was very, very unpopular still. You can see where this is going, right? All of these little things are like building up one by one against the British. Um, next slide. Pause if you need to. So unrest and disillusionment. So you you take a big turn in Egypt when certain things start to happen. So one of them is World War II. Uh, Italy, if you guys remember, Italy attacked Egypt. It was a very small portion of your book, of your book but in 1940 they attacked. The British come in and use that as an excuse to say, we're here to save you, but you need to give us all the power. And so they increased all their military presence and control of Egypt on February 4th, 1942. Um, Britain forced the king of Egypt to basically pick the WAFT party, which was going to listen to the British a lot more than any other party that existed in Egypt at that time, um, to basically bend the knee and obey, right? You must obey the British. Uh, this was a very embarrassing moment for Egypt. The people of Egypt felt very embarrassed because their government was allowing this to happen and they were not happy. And Egypt was not a country that was allowed to make their own decisions. Somebody else was making the decisions for them. A little island all the way across in a, on a different continent was making their decisions. Um, before the events of 1948 is when the king finally loses his crown, basically. It's like the the thing that snapped everything. Um, there is this war that Egypt engages in against Israel because they are fighting for Palestine, um, who they have allegiance to because of, they have that Arab solidarity. Um, but Israel was more superior in battle. Um, despite this, though, Egypt still tried to fight back um, for Palestine, and they lasted about 10 months before they had to give up. Uh, they were humiliated in the eyes of Egyptians. This was another form of humiliation and a shame that was brought to them. And the Egyptians, the soldiers, were really pissed off. They blamed the Egyptian king. They said they abandoned them by giving them like crappy weapons that didn't that you know did not work during battle, and you know they were set up for failure basically. And that was very that made them unhappy. That created a lot of tension in Egypt. So again, here's another thing that's being stacked up against you know opening the way for Nazir. Next one, pause if you need to. Um, so all of this chaos is like going crazy in the 40s and in the 50s during Egypt, early 50s during Egypt. Neither the king nor the prime ministers, any prime minister knew how to do anything. On top of that, prime ministers were being assassinated um, and a lot of unpopular parties were, were being placed into power. Um, you know, the WAF party 
gets set aside for these other unpopular parties parties and then they come back uh, and so people think that maybe things can can start to change now that the party is back in power uh, but that was like all you know an illusion disillusionment right so basically nothing changes nothing changes um people are still unhappy with the egyptian government and this was due to the fact that a lot of the officials in that government as you can see in the pictures um, were more interested in growing their wealth rather than helping the people these people were career politicians their families had been in power um, long before and they were calling the shots and they owned property and they own you know businesses and all of that and all of the wealth right while all of these people were starving so there was this disconnect between who was in charge and who they were representing and they couldn't you know there was no commonality between them um, they couldn't even begin to understand or did not want to understand how the people of Egypt were suffering um, and because of this you know they were not able to really control any riots or any protests that were happening against them um, and so this is the moment where Egypt, the people of Egypt start to say, we need an authoritarian to come in and kind of fix things for us because this government is weak. They're bowing down to the, the British and they are only interested in their own money and serving the rich rather than the poor or the working class. Last slide, pause if you need to. All right, so out of this chaos there's this movement that's formed known as the free officers these people were people young people who served during that israeli war egypt against israel um and basically they were disillusioned they were upset they were upset with their own government um, one of them being nazir uh, he was one of the soldiers that fought and basically the free officers believed that they were the ones that could free egypt of everything that was holding them back from, um, you know, and everything that was bringing them down. Their main objective was to basically overthrow the king, um, the monarchy, through a military coup, basically using military weapons to over, or just the military to overthrow people. So the next time we kind of look into into Egypt, we are going to get more details on who Nazir is and who the free officers are and what they did um, to achieve getting into power. Okay. But with that, I'll leave you. Uh, don't forget to like, comment. I'm just, I'm just kidding. See you later. Bye.